Welcome back to DealBook. We are, this is going to be fun. Uh, our next guests are the co-hosts of Armchair Expert, Dax Shepard and Monica Padman. It's a podcast they launched in 2018 that became a sensation. Uh, in its first year, Armchair Expert became the most downloaded new podcast on iTunes. When the duo moved their series and entire archive over to Spotify, this time the streaming company cited their show now as one of the most listened to in the world. Their dedicated fan base calls themselves Arm Cherries, and their guests run the gamut. Uh, Prince Harry, the Duke of Su uh, Sussex, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, Carmelo Anthony, Michael Pollan, Bill Gates, Barack Obama, and so many others. Uh, and I listen to it religiously. I'm thrilled to welcome them both to DealBook. I should tell you guys, I put my sneakers on. I've been wearing fancy shoes all day. Uh, we had the Secretary oh. of State here, but I figured for you guys, we should just have some fun. Um, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I first wanted to apologize for being overdressed. I'm just coming from a funeral. So <laughs> forgive my wardrobe. I'm so sorry. And we, I just have to acknowledge that we're so giddy to join you. It feels like when the Clampets would get invited over to their neighbors, <laughs> the Beverly Hillbillies. So thanks for having us. We're incredibly flattered to be joining this group of people. Well, uh, I'm excited to have you guys because I wanted to talk to you about, you guys have somehow tapped into something. Uh, in a remarkable way. Uh, I listen to you religiously. There's obviously the whole sort of shift of just podcasting more generally. But specifically, what you guys have done, I think, over the past couple of years has just been a remarkable to see and how it's sort of changing culture. And changing, by the way, we've been doing interviews here, the art of the interview. And, and in many ways, that's what I wanted to start talking to you uh, about. Our good friend, uh, Adam Grant, uh, had this to say about you guys. Um, and I think that it's, it's really true. You said, uh, they said, rather, or he said, rather, you have inverse charisma. Do you know about this? You may well, I, he invented this, I think, while I was interviewing him. But yes, we're aware of it because I think he dropped it on us real time. Yeah. Okay, but so. Go ahead. Well, but I'll say the wonders of you. You make every guest you bring on more interesting and likable. And I wanted to just understand, like, where you think this whole thing comes from and how you've gotten, you know, we think that we've, we've gotten some pretty interesting guests over the past couple of days, but you get some really interesting guests, but you get them to say things they would never say anywhere else. How do you think that happens? Well, we're so unlikable that whoever comes in <laughs> automatically <laughs> seems so like. Yeah, it's, it's uh, stand next to heavier people from uh, the Rodney Dayton. No. no, but I, I, for, for real, what I would say to that is, first and foremost, I think we have something for whatever reason you can't really cast. We started arguing in my kitchen seven years ago about a podcast serial, and we just have this insatiable desire to one up one another uh, and invest each other in a debate. So that's like the core of it. Um, but I think just me being an AA for 17 years and being just very used to sharing my story and often my failures, most often my failures, as a route of, of connecting with one another, I think because we applied that same kind of formula to the show, which at times is nauseating because as a host, I'm talking way more than one should, but, but it is an effort to first own my own failures and regrets in, in hopes that the people will meet me there. And I just, from being in that program for so long, I personally learned so much more from people blowing it than people standing on a stage with a trophy. I don't have much to learn from that, but I certainly have a lot to learn from people who have to redefine their identity uh, when they get a career bump, when they've got to uh, pivot and, 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 and explore something else. You know, all these things I can learn a lot from. Do, do you buy, though, that there's a sea change going on here and that podcasting, not just the medium itself, but that's actually changed the message? I do. I think, you know, and, and I think all of us are pretty aware of what the 140 character communication did to us. And I think uh, we would all acknowledge things have gotten really binary they're black or they're white. And I think we're all craving nuance. And I think the long form of a podcast is the exact place to have all that nuance. And I think all of us were just like, yeah, give me that back. Like, I'm so sick of reading a headline or a 140 character opinion or one photo to sum up everything. It's like, I want the deep dive. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you agree with this? Yeah. I'm steamrolling. No, Please. no, no, oh. no. This is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to add that I think that's across the board now with all types of media, with streaming and every people are finding their niche. Mass appeal is going away, which is great. I think people can feel connected. But I will also add when we started this, we didn't know much about anything and we definitely didn't do it because podcasts were popular and we didn't do it because we knew there was potential for any financial anything like we just did it because why not and now because because things have proven to work out in this arena for a lot of people i do think i'm i'm a little interested to see where podcasting goes for other people because they are now. So, they yeah. Are so what do you think? And by the way, now that you have this deal with Spotify, has it changed anything about how you do it? Do you, I, 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 it looks like you've upped the frequency. Like, do you have to do it more? Do you, does that change the dynamic? No. In fact, we promised them less than what we had delivered oh, really? in the previous year. So we promised them two a week and said, you know, we'll often do a third when it's when we're interested in something, we have this offshoot called Armchair and Dangerous yep. where we bunk conspiracy theories. So, you know, everything beyond two a week would just be gravy uh, from their perspective in the deal. And it, it hasn't, if anything, what it's changed is because they do dynamic ads and we did not do dynamic ads, we did baked in ads. We actually work less on the part we didn't love doing, and we focus way more now on just the creative aspect of it. So for, from our side of the street, it's been nothing but a joy. They're incredible. They've been so good to us. They've not we told heard us one to thing. do anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Monica, you, you said, though, that you thought that all of this is fractured. I mean, the, 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 the business, uh, not just, I'm going to say fractured, the, the media is now fractured, and, but, and podcasts, too, are much more sort of na narrow for specific groups. But you have a mass appeal podcast, and I'm curious how you think that happened and whether you think that's possible today. Is it a function of the fact that it started when it started? I think that's part of it. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think being early on the scene, definitely not first, but early what is definitely a benefit to us that we can't we couldn't control or anything but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's tricky to, to uh, i guess we would both probably imagine if we launched today it, it would be much much harder um not just i mean when we launched there were still eight hundred thousand active podcasts now there's three million but not only are there three million but all of our peers are now also doing it so everyone's got some cachet in the space and some built-in audience um but I, but I do think, um, I, and I'm not, I have, this is not an accusation against anyone, but I can feel the difference between people who are pursuing this as a business and people who just couldn't help but find a way to do this. And, and we just happen to be in that latter group, I think. And again, with, as Monica said, zero uh, fantasies of, of monetizing it. And, and so the irony that it was the most successful thing for either of us that we've ever been a part of is, is, is at times comical for us because I, I'm a greedy little piggy. Everything I pursued before this was to get that green, green dollar. And this thing, I didn't think about it. And the, the green, green dollar came. It's, There's some it's poetic weird. justice yeah. to it a little bit. So I want to know about the art of the interview because you guys are listeners. That's the other thing that I noticed. You listen more than anybody out there. And you, oh, most of your questions seem to come literally from the answer. And I want to know, so what, how much preparation goes into this? What are you doing? How do you do it? Well, I do research prior. I always do it day of because inevitably when I'm reading about somebody, a few things stand out. Your coloba. How do I say it? Coloboma. You're talking about my left eye. Coloboma. Coloboma. Yes, so by the right. way, Dax, you know about the coloboma because you've seen me in person. I don't know. If some, some of the audience may, if they notice it, it my eye... Uh, Troops a little bit. I was born with it. It's called a cold bone. My eyes are fine, by the way, just it, for it, but, but, but make care. Perfect. Let me tell you something, though. When, when I first met you, I was so drawn to your coloboma <laughs> that I immediately had to find out what was going on. I want to know, like, how did that impact your childhood? Have you, do you have stories yeah. about why you didn't get this? Because that, and, and for me, I, you're just, you're novel. I'm so attracted to anything novel or unique. And I, I, I could stare at you at dinner. You're, you could be a terrible conversationalist. I could get through it because of that thing. 
But back to the research. <laughs> Thank oh, no, you. This, Thank this you so much. Relevant. This actually is relevant. Because Dax has a theory that I think is a, a beautiful way of looking at life. I don't know that I 100% agree, but he believes that you can fall in love with anyone. Right. That, that if you're on an island with any human on earth, you can choose to fall in love with them. And I think that approach is brought into this attic. Like we fall in love with the people here. And yeah, even people we think, or I think, Monica's much better than me. She never thinks she's going to dislike somebody, but I, I often think I'm going to. And, and invariably, when I hear the specifics of any human being's story, I end up kind of liking them. But the research thing, I just want to say, I have to do a day of, because in, in general, I find at least a couple nuggets in my research that I'm really intrigued by, and, and that has a half-life. So if right. I do the research the day before, by the next morning, it's diminished by some percentage. So... I want to do my research and walk directly in to talk to you because I'm most uh, curious about you. And um, but I also was we were given great advice by um, Chris Hardwick at the beginning. He said, you know, please feel free to get away from your research because your research inevitably starts charting out the whole conversation. And then when people are playing their part and going where you hope they would go, you're not learning anything. You're, you're just checking it off your list. And and, right. and I we took that to heart and and. We always have the research. It's always there, but it, it's a safety net. And some of our best interviews, like uh, Hillary Clinton, the highlight for us is like learning that that Bill collects DVDs like every old man does. Like that's not in my notes to find out, right. uh, but that makes her so human to us that her but stupid you, husband has a stupid DVD collection. <laughs> but it often feels like there is a beginning, a middle, and an end to the way you do it. Is, is that not the, I mean, I'll tell you, when, when I do an interview, even with you guys, I think to myself, I often think it's like a, like a plane ride. I know I got to start at JFK. I know I got to land at LAX. I probably am going to stop at O'Hare and I may be Dallas and Denver. The weather may change up there along the way. So I may have to, I may have to move around and change, change the order. And hopefully, by the way, we may get pushed down to Atlanta by accident. I didn't even know it. But, but that, I, that, that there's like an, I hate to say an agenda, that sounds terrible, but th there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a plan of sorts. Okay, okay, so in the broadest, loosest sense, the objective is generally, at least on Mondays, now Thursdays is experts, they're professors, they're lawyers, they're doctors, so it's, it's, it's a different, yeah, yeah, experts. But on Monday, my, I guess the, the overall question is always, okay, you're rich and famous, did it solve all of your internal issues. Uh, it, it's been my experience that it didn't solve mine. And then you're kind of back to the drawing board. So I'm very curious for people how they've navigated uh, realizing a fantasy and what the reality of the fantasy is. And then how did they have to adjust based on the fact that none of us live in an actual fantasy? What do you do when, when it's not working? Huh? I st I'll tell you, I start telling a ton of personal stories. <laughs> this has happened a handful of times where we're, we're and when we have a kind of a look and we go like, yeah, this person does, is not chatty. It yeah. is what it is. Um, it's time for me to dust off some old embarrassing stories about myself. Yeah. And I mean, I think the only time it's going off the rails a little bit is when the person is too focused on that, on hitting their marks. Right. When they are like, oh, I got to say this. And they're and the I talking points. The talking points. I mean, this is right. In the news business. Yeah. 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 They're in their head. And so I think the smartest thing to do in that case is to like totally take a left turn and hat and Dax. Yeah. talks about like, you know, a seal biting his hand and that causing this. And then that opens it up. It just like relieves the, the expectation that anything normal is going to happen. There is some illusion in the process, which is like, I, I tend to like let them get their talking points out so they feel like they did their job. And then I almost want the conversation to take such a detour that they think it's not going to air. Like, well, this has nothing to do with anything. I bet they'll edit this out. And now we're chatting. What do you do with the talking points part? Do you edit the talking point part out? No, no, we, 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 we I got to say, we're, we're, we're mildly ethical on this show. Like, hey, we let people cut out whatever they want because we're not a news organization i'm not trying to break stories so like if someone regrets being too vulnerable or too open that night we cut it out that hurts us quite often which is usually our favorite part but we do that um we really do try to give people a moment to 
come get what they want oh, yeah. out, of, out of the experience. Well, um, what do you make of the again, idea? And, and because it's not an eight minute segment like Kimmel, right. the, all these things, all these goals are you can accomplish. Yeah. Everyone can get what they wanted out of an hour and a half interview. Do you consider it news or do you consider it entertainment? It's definitely not news, I don't think. I don't think it's news. No, no. no. I, I, boy, it is entertainment. I mean, yes, objectively, it's entertainment. Of course, I feel like it, it has something more. Um, I think boys, I grew up as a boy. I think I inherited a lot of insane stuff socially that I've been trying to shake my whole life. And I, I, I do hope that younger men listen to it. And I somehow am somebody who's an example of being flawed and vulnerable and all these things like so for me, it, there is a mission to it, but I'm not that lofty. Yes, it's entertainment. How often do you, are there, are there guests that you want to go, but sometimes you get guests that are in the middle of the, what I call a news cycle. And mm -hmm. so the reason I ask that is, are there people that something happens, you say, man, I want to talk to him, uh, or man, I want to talk to her right now, or, yeah. I mean, I don't know, yeah, would you want to go talk, to, would you want to talk to like, you know, Aaron Rodgers right now? Uh, I, I would love to. Uh, you know who I wanted to talk to more than anybody at the time of the crisis was was Roseanne Barr, because I I and, and sometimes people will get critical of us. We'll have a guest on that. Why don't you ask them about X, Y, and Z? And my defense of that is because that's what everyone's going to ask them. Like you should come here to hear something that you're not going to hear on the normal news cycle. Like that's actually our mission. So we haven't copped out by not asking that question is that you are going to hear the answer. You already that. know the answer. But for me, for Roseanne, the bigger question, aside from the abhorrent kind of racial aspect, was here is a woman who self-destructed publicly twice. And, and I'm dying to know what's broken inside that she would manifest this outcome over and over again. And I, 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 I actually have a genuine perhaps compassion, despite how abhorrent her behavior was, and just someone that would not believe they were worthy of something over and over and over again. It, it, you know, I'm interested in that. I want to find out what's really happening. We, we have a question from the audience that's uh, about listening. Uh, and the question is, in all of the lessons you've learned about listening on this show, have you been able to apply any of these learnings to your personal life, do you think? Do you think, uh, yeah. <laughs> have you? <laughs> what do you think? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't think you could get away from just the mechanics of practice that we do several times a week. And I do think uh, a couple things have happened that are, were unintended um, positive outcomes. A, your your brain is sharper. Our brains are sharper now doing the podcast than they were previously. You know, we'll have Eric Lander on, yep. uh, you know, uh, who runs the Broad Institute. It's like I gotta I gotta relearn. Uh, mitosis and meiosis on Wednesday because we're talking about on Thursday. Like, so that's helped our sharpness. And I also think, yeah, we can have a conversation at the drop of a hat with just about anybody. And it's part of it's just practice, I think. And and just knowing everyone has something to offer, even the people who are, are slow to open up or were like nervous before we start, because we're like, are they going to be able to speak to us? It just We've learned so much that like right. anyone has something to offer. Is there any, anybody off limits in your mind that you just wouldn't, you know, right now there's a big debate about quote unquote platforming people. In fact, oh. before, the other way, before, before you guys came on, I did an interview with Darren Woods, who's the CEO of Exxon Mobil. And I got, we got thousands of, thousands of letters from people saying, you got to cancel that interview. You know, this guy is, you know, active, you know, climate activist who said you just can't even engage with him. And so I'm curious, are there people that you say to yourself, I, I don't want to talk to? So Monica and I differ on this, um, which is great. I think it's why this show is, works. Um, so we have different takes on this. I, 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 I absolutely reject the notion of platforming. I, I think that anytime you've ruled out discourse, I, I just I, I think there's a fundamental uh, belief I have uh, that that violates. I, I don't believe never talking to your enemy, never talking to your opponents is a good idea. I want to interview Putin more than any person on the planet. I want to talk to Putin. Vladimir. Putin's Putin. on your list, okay. Big on my list. Now, Monica probably would be like, I don't want Putin. I'm a little scared of that interview. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I would interview Trump. I'm a liberal. I would love to interview Trump. I would, lo I would love to interview anybody I find interesting. I don't think there should be rules on who you're allowed to talk to. 
I think people's bad ideas are best heard because that's when you find out how bad their ideas are. They're, they're more powerful when they're silenced. Okay, but what about people who are in trouble? And I, I, you know, I, I mentioned, by the way, like Aaron Rodgers. Would you want to talk to an Aaron Rodgers? You got to bring me up to speed. Is he an anti-vaxxer or something? He's an anti. I, I, yeah, sorry. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, he 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 was he's the football player who who said that he was immunized. He really wasn't. He's now not playing uh, this weekend, and uh, it, it created a, a bit of a, a, a stir around the country. Yes, I would love to talk to him about that because we we've, we've delved into this issue nonstop since it started. Monica and I have much different positions on it. We have much different childhoods. I am always suspicious of authority. I'm cynical. I don't believe. I think everyone's got an intention. I did all the right things throughout all of COVID. I quarantined. I wore masks. I got vaccinated. But my instinct was opposite. So I would love to know why Aaron Rodgers truly has his position more than what he might claim as his position. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky because the the nature of these interviews is, as you started this by right. saying, people come off very sympathetic. They do because we're having very human conversations and everyone can come off sympathetic. So I have some fear that we, if we talk to someone who is doing something truly bad and we're making them sound good, which is what we do, we make everyone sound good. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know what that does right. to- See, yeah, and I, I happen to believe that people have falsely I uh, have a paradigm where to be compassionate would then mean you're not going to be punitive in any way. And, and I don't agree with that. I think you can be very, very yeah. compassionate of criminals and also send them to jail when they do something wrong. I don't think it's an either or. Okay, maybe, maybe a toughie because you guys work for the same company. What do you guys think of Joe Rogan? Okay, so here, go. I'll let Monica start. No, I have, I have very few opinions on the road to be, to be, transparent i've never listened to that show so i don't know <laughs> i have a ton of respect for him i have a lot of admiration for what he has done in this space i think he's incredibly intelligent and i don't agree with a lot of the things he says but i think as a person i i totally dig him and i don't agree with him sometimes um i'm curious you know there's something about this being in your ears and you know we're obviously doing something on video here do you think this could ever be a TV show? Have you guys ever talked about that? Yeah, people have expressed a desire to, for us to put this on some kind of a, a platform. But my hunch is, and again, who knows? We might change our mind, but something happens without cameras pointed at you. When all you have is headphones on, you, you, you enter a, a, a zone. The second you think about being viewed, uh, that I, I just think that the level of vulnerability that we seem to be getting pretty consistently would go away under bright lights, people doing your makeup, cameras yeah. pointed at you. It's just, uh, and, and also, I, I don't like the listener being distracted by my new tattoo and your Coloba. And you know, I want, I want <laughs> and people to- And you do have a new tattoo. Saying. Everybody should see it. We, we can see it right there on your arm, right? There you go. Okay. Wait, which way do I do it? I don't even know did how that to hurt, do it. Did that hurt to get, I mean- It was okay. It was okay. Oh. But it's a crow with a che arm cherry, a cherry in its mouth. Wow. Um, we have another question from the audience. And this one uh, from somebody who clearly listens to the program. Uh, Andrew, was what was that? Wow. That was that was a terror. You did not sell it. Was that a lousy wow? That wow said, "Oh my God, what has he done?" <laughs> no, I got to get close. Uh, the camera is far away from me, so I can't. I, the screen is. It's, it's not. Like, you have a screen that's close to you. I'm not that cl that close. Okay. Okay. okay that explains it. Yeah, that explains it. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to come up with something here. Um, <laughs> so, so the question from the audience is. How has your relapse shaped your current priorities with your personal and public life? And can you talk about the day seven episode? Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, this, is, this is a big one and it's an interesting experience because there's no way I couldn't have admitted to that. I, I'm too known on the show for being, having been sober for 16 years. A lot of people you know, looked up to me in that capacity. A lot of people messaged me. It's, it's, it was really, really important to me. And it I, would have I, been irresponsible for us to not address it. So 
when we discuss that, that's its own thing. And we have control over that situation. And then when we record it, we have control over that thing. And then we even get to pick like, what days is coming out? What are we going to tell you? There's all these little moments of control. But then when it was out, it certainly became a different experience for me, which is like, oh, wow, now, now it's completely out of my control. Like I, you know, however people interpret this or if they think I'm fraudulent or this or that, um, that's all left. The, the, the horse has left the barn. Yeah. But ultimately it's been really just positive. There hasn't been, no one's really tried to, I mean, some people who hate me, some, some anti-vaxxers who hate me, you know, they went to town on me, but in general, I think it, it was more helpful than it was um, I mean, disappointing. He can't, I mean, so many, so many people reached out and felt super connected to that story. Right. And sober people who know how hard it is every day. And, it's, and it reminded everyone how tenuous this thing is that we're all attempting to do. It's like to breathe and, and get through each day. <laughs> Can so, I have- can I ask you guys about your relationship uh, for a second? Because one of the things that, that I've noticed as a listener is that the power dynamic, it seems to me, has shifted over time. Or at least it's, it seems like that. I don't, I don't know. I, I will say when, it, when this first started, I thought, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, I thought there was like a Howard Robin situation going on. Yeah. Um, but I think it's actually sh- changed. Um, especially like in the last year and a half, do you feel that? Big time. That's interesting. I mean, I mean, by the way, the Howard Robin situation is what we kind of predicated this. On. Like we we love Howard so much; he's kind of the North Star. And so it was like, yeah, let's have a let's have an extra voice there. And then I guess I've just gotten louder and more obnoxious. Well, my, <laughs> my my opinion is it's kind of Howard and Robert, Rob, Robert, Robin 2.0 in that Monica doesn't generally second what I'm saying. In fact, her, her proclivity seems to be outing me when I'm wrong. She, you know, her it's her job to keep me. Um, she disagrees with me a ton. She's the opposite of a yes person. But I, what I'll say is... People often write me like, get Monica a lazy boy. Why aren't you letting her? And I'm like, if you think I'm making the decisions for Monica, <laughs> you don't know Monica. She's in the chair she wants to be in. And likewise, I'll just say, I always wanted Monica super involved. Uh, she's one of my favorite points of view to hear from. And I just think Monica, who's been in the public eye now for three years and not 20 years, was just building confidence. People were coming to know her. As guests arrive now that might have listened to the show, they they love Monica, so they want to interact with her. Like just many things have coalesced to make it more even-handed. And I, I imagine it'll continue to get more and more 50-50 as we go on. Okay, final quick questions, rapid fire. I know that's probably uh, you know a cliche of a convention here. Uh, favorite guest? Do you guys agree on this? We agree on a couple of the we Dex's, have to do top three. Dex's mom. My mom, dog the bounty hunter for me. In Kazaria. Yeah, that was, was great. an incredible episode. Okay. Yeah. Bill Fair. Gates. For us, though, I think we always will come back to Bill Gates. That's the one where we just couldn't believe we were talking to him and he was so adorable. Oh my god, Playful. Matt Damon. I can't Matt Damon. Matt Damon. That's okay. her number. I know it, it's uncouth to say, but is there is there a guest that didn't work for you? Not that we air. We've only had a <laughs> We've had a single guest. We've had a single guest where it just simply didn't work, and it would be unairable. And then we've had maybe three guests who ultimately were like, "I just would wish you don't even release it." And we said, "Fine," just because they maybe felt like it was too, too exposed. exposing. Okay. And was it? Do you think were they being too sensitive? You don't want to say who they are, I assume. I'm not going to say who they are, but what what is comical, I'll say, is that on the bar or on the the, the graph of how exposing they were. All three of these people were like a two. So it's just, it, 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 it bared no relationship to right. actually how much, you know, how vulnerable they had been or exposing. And then uh, podcasts that you listen to that are not your own. I like The Daily. Good answer. <laughs> good answer, given where you are. That's good. Yeah. I like the daily as well. I, I really like revisionist history a lot. Malcolm's uh, I love radio lab. Uh, we love this American life. Uh, oh, I loved um, uh, more perfect the the, the federal. Uh, yep. Yeah. There's a, there's so many. Oh, 
Uh, for juice, we love Dr. Death. First season of Dr. Death oh, is like wow, the tastiest yeah. ride ever. Also, we've been listening to Winds of Change. That's a good one. That's yeah, a great that's, one. Oh, your guys' is Rabbit Hole, New York Times. Oh, that was, Rabbit Hole was insanely killed great. Killed it. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, this has been a ball. I hope we get to do this again, hopefully in person Me next too. time. Maybe in our Me ears. Too. We'll see. Thanks, everybody. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Andrew. We're yeah, so flattered. See you soon. We're back in a moment.